everybody. Welcome to our online service this morning. I'm Chris, if you don't know me. And uh, yeah, it's good to have you with us today. Um, if you don't know, today we're having this 9 o'clock online and then we are having a little service in the uh, green space behind our building today at 1050. So if you want to, um, or you know somebody that might at uh, 1050, you bring a lawn chair and a Bible, join us out there for uh, uh, another service this afternoon. Um, also, if you need to grab the notes for um, Tony's sermon here coming up, you can grab the notes at our website, mosaicmansfield.com, or at the Facebook page. So when you get a second, you can uh, pull those notes up, you follow along today. Um, also, continue to stay connected through, uh, with us through that website and the Facebook page uh, for upcoming stuff. If you need to contact us, if you need to give us a prayer request so we can be praying for you, or to give online, um, mosaicmansfield.com the mosaic uh, Facebook page is where you'll keep finding updates and all those things so um, in case you aren't fully aware indoor services will resume if we get back to yellow and or orange uh, in Richland County so um, yeah just keep watching for updates on that but as soon as we can we'll go we'll do 9 o'clock and 1050 here in the building and there will not be RSVP. There will be limited children's ministry. It'll be a first come, first serve thing. But you can pre-check in your kids in advance throughout the week, just like we have done our RSVP system in the in the past. So um, watch for that. As soon as we get back to yellow or orange, we'll be planning on doing those services. A um, couple other things this morning, uh, quickly. Um, if you haven't seen, there are opportunities for both men and women to get together in smaller groups and, and grow together this fall. And uh, these groups will be starting this week. You can continue to get, if you can't make it yet this week, you can still get in on them, you know, starting in week two. But for the next five, six weeks, we've got some groups uh, coming together and growing together via, uh, some of them are Zoom, some are in homes. And uh, I believe there's a men's group that's going to be meeting at, here at the church on Saturday morning. So there's a few different opportunities, a couple for ladies, a couple for men. Jump online, find out the information on that, and you can register through the website there. So do that right away if you're interested in doing that. And then the last thing this morning, uh, we've been talking about this drive through adventure on October 24th, which is a big drive around town scavenger hunt. You can win prizes. You can compete against the rest of the Mosaic uh, family. Uh, and uh, do it with your do it with some friends do it as a family however you want to but the way that's going to work on the 24th is you'll check in here at the church between one and four and then you'll have two hours to kind of go do the scavenger hunt around town and it's uh it's via an app so you can like post pictures and see what everybody else is doing it's really fun it's going to be a great way for us to connect together this uh, this fall. And so um, registration for that is online as well. So go to the What's Happening part of the uh, website or Facebook. We've always got it up there. So, yeah, there's, there's uh, some info for you this morning. I'll stop with that, and I'll pray for us, and we'll get back to worshiping together. Father, thank you uh, for these opportunities that we're talking about this morning to uh, continue to grow uh, with each other and with you this fall. Uh, Lord, we just continue to ask us to, uh, or ask you to help us um, to just keep seeking you this fall as things continue to be kind of weird and uncertain right now. Uh, Lord, we know you are good. You are unchanging. Help us to keep seeking you and continuing to reach out to each other 
to care for each other, to, to grow together. Lord, we need you and we need each other. Um, may we be reminded of that this morning and may we um, grow even this morning in, uh, in just being connected to you, enjoying being in your presence. Lord, lead us and guide us and speak to us today. Um, and go, Lord, would it just be, uh, just asking that this would be a wonderful Sabbath day for all of us today where we can rest a bit and rest in you today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. At your name The mountains shake and crumble your name the oceans roar and tumble at your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry out Lord of all the earth we shout your name Shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. At your name, the morning breaks in glory.
take my pain and you turn it into joy you turn it into joy you 
May we, Lord, um, rejoice in being adopted into your family, that we are brothers and sisters of Jesus, our Savior, yes, but also our brother and our keeper. So may we, Lord God, just revel in you. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to do something this morning. I want to do something this morning. We're going to look at a couple different texts real quick in regard to our prayer, because this is what I want us to do. This needs to be participatory. You know, it's, it's funny, during this last song, as I'm thinking through what it is to participate, to have an opportunity to participate together with one another, I think in terms of this, you know, I'm sitting in an empty room that is devoid of anyone other than those who are serving right now. <clears throat> and uh, as I pictured singing and as I thought about the word participate and how it is we, I think I'd like to guide us in prayer today. I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking like Elijah coming before God and saying, I'm the only one, there's no one else. And, and God saying, no, there are others that have not bent their knee to Baal. And Ezekiel who's crying out and show me God. And he said, I can raise up these dry bones and give them life. And I'm thinking to myself, really what's happening right now is the Spirit of God is moving among us and we are participants in the kingdom right now. You know, Revelation says that um, there are bowls of incense in the throne room of God and the, and the incense that is emanating and rising up and filling the nostrils of our Father, they're bringing him pleasure are the prayers of the saints. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like us to participate in prayer today. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 11 with me real quick. And I want us, you know, it's, it's just so incredibly appropriate that, that uh, the band just sang um, and led us in the song Good Father because that's exactly where Jesus takes us to when the disciples ask a really important question. So we're in Luke chapter 11, we're going to start at verse 1. And this is, these, I'm, just, I'm guiding us through scripture at, to pray. So look what it says here. It says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. And, he, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. God, Jesus, we see you praying and we see the effect of prayer and we sense the power of prayer as you pray. Teach us to pray. Show us how to pray. Give us this opportunity to, to um, indulge in the relationship we have with our Father. And Jesus said this. He says, when you pray, say this. He says, Father, hallowed or holy is your name, to be honored, to be revered. And I want to stop here for a moment. I want to, this, this, uh, this, I'm not here to study this or to teach this. I'm here to guide us in prayer. So what I'm going to ask us all to do is to take this moment and walk through this prayer as a prayer to our Father, to this good Father of whom we just sang and who we experience and who wants his will done. So just join me in it if you says, it says, when you pray, say this, Father, holy is your name. May your kingdom come. May it move forward. May it accomplish your will, accomplish your purposes. May it invade this space. So give us today, each day, our daily bread. May we, Father, come before you and trust your great provision. And forgive us our sins as we fall short of the righteousness that we are in Christ, as we see the good that we should do and for whatever reason hold back from doing it. When we see the thing we ought not do and we, we desire to do what's good, but we do the thing we didn't want to do, Father, forgive us when we sin. Restore us to your side. Reestablish the closeness and the intimacy of our relationship. Make me effective in you. And do this as I forgive the sins of others, those who sin against me. May my heart be set in such a way as to be humble before you and, and, and just basking in your mercy. Receiving your forgiveness as I so desperately want and need it. May I then have the same heart toward others and may I forgive them for sinning against me. So forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And now lead us on a path of righteousness. Lead us away from temptation. Do not let us be over, overrun. Do not let us be dominated. But instead, Father, may we follow you and look up to you. 
pick our faces up that we might see you. Now what I want to do is, having prayed that, that is a prayer that Jesus is teaching the disciples to pray for themselves. There's another one that I want to go through that's even just as appropriate or maybe appropriate, more acutely appropriate to the day. Go to Philippians chapter four with me, if you would. And again, this is a prayer we're going to pray, but we're gonna pray this one a little differently. I'm gonna ask you again to participate in this. I'm gonna ask you to pray this scripture with me, not only for yourself, though. What I'm gonna ask is that we keep in mind someone we would pray this for. Do we know someone who's suffering with fear or anxiety? Do we know anyone who's, who's just overwhelmed by their circumstances? Do we know anyone who is under the weight of either their own sin and those consequences or just the world and its effect or, or just, they're just, right now they're just staggered, they're struggling. So not only should do what do I want us to pray this for us now, I want us to be, to be mindful of and to be praying for somebody in our lives, somebody we know, somebody we see, who we can be praying for at this time. So we're in Philippians 4, we're gonna start at verse four. And again, this is participatory, so please join me in this. It says this, it says, rejoice in the Lord always. May my heart be full of joy. May I rejoice in you. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Convince me, God. Convince my heart. May I be persuaded. May I work toward rejoicing in you. May I allow this rejoicing to replace all other things. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. So Lord, may your character as it's formed and shaped in me, the person of Jesus as he is, as he is present in me, reflect his gentleness, his tenderness, his meekness, his care. May I be evident of that. May those I pray for also. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Thank you for being close at hand, Lord God. And we pray for those that we love and that you, they would recognize your nearness. Father, do not let me be anxious about anything and relieve the anxiety of my loved ones. If you can hear those sirens in the background, let's pray for that right now. Father, we thank you for those who respond to people in need and in trouble. Lord God, I pray right now for a blessing upon them that you would keep them safe, give them strength and wisdom, insight, quick hands, and gentle care. Father, we pray for the one to whom they're going to serve. Lord, pray that you would put your healing hand there and you would be present. And Lord, just uh, be present in that moment. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. So we go back to this Philippians 4 and it says, rejoice in the Lord. May we rejoice, may I rejoice, and may those I pray for rejoice. May we all reflect, may I reflect, and may those I love reflect your, your gentleness. And may it be evident to anyone who sees us. Remind us that you are near. Help us to not be anxious about anything. Father, I pray for my friends and my family who are anxious, who are heavy, heavy just, just burdened by this life. And may they now pray with me and as I pray for them and as I pray for myself, as I lay, lay this petition out before you with thanksgiving, knowing and trusting that you will do what you say. We present these requests to you, Lord God. And Father, let your peace fall on us, this peace that transcends every circumstance we find ourselves in. We shouldn't even be at peace, so it is so difficult to just comprehend how we would receive it. But Lord, we thank you for it. And guard our hearts and guard our minds in Christ Jesus. So help us and help those I love to begin changing what I think about. May we think about whatever is true and noble, whatever is right and pure, whatever is lovely and admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, we are to think about, may we think about those things. And I would encourage each of us just to take that moment right now and just to think in those terms. What is true? What is noble? What is right? What is pure? What is lovely? What is admirable? What is excellent and praiseworthy? Fill our minds, fill our hearts with those things. May we, Lord God, see that. May we see you working in our lives, in our loved ones' lives. We lift that up to you, Lord Jesus. And there's one more prayer I think we need to be participating in this morning. And it's from Second Peter chapter 1. 
excuse me, 1 Peter chapter 2. No, 1 Peter chapter 2, right? And it's a prayer we've been praying on and off all summer long, but it's because where we are as a people and as a nation. So join with me in this prayer, if you would. Paul writes, I urge you then, first of all, that requests, prayers and intercession, petitions be made with thanksgiving for everyone. So Lord God, we lift up those that we know and those that we love and those that, uh, those that are dear to us. And pray, Father, you are, your hand of blessing would be upon them, that you would make yourself known and present and powerful in their lives. Then it goes on to say in the scriptures, not only we do this for everyone, but in particular for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. God says this is good and pleases him who is our savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So Father, we come before you and we lift up those people who are in authority in this nation, those people who you, you have chosen, established, and placed in, in, uh, in authority and in, with the power to govern. And we pray, Lord God, that they would see you first and foremost, that their hearts, Lord God, would be rent, that those who know you, Father, would stand with great integrity and would reflect you in all things, that they would garner your wisdom, Lord God, and plead for it as Solomon did. Ask for it as James tells us to and we lack it. May they trust that you, Father, who do not hold anything against them for needing wisdom, will give to them generously because they've asked. So may, our, may those people in, in those positions, Lord, seek you and seek your wisdom. And may you respond in kind, Lord God. May, they, may those who know you, Father, continue to be a testimony of your grace, and may they have a deep and profound impact on the other, other, those others around them who govern. And Father, we lift up those who govern who don't know you and pray that they would come to know you, that their hearts would be prepared to hear the gospel and to see the light of the gospel, to see the testimony of the people around them, that they, Lord, would recognize that you, your hand has placed them where they are. You have established the place where they sit. And may they come to know you. Your word says, Lord, it says that praying this way is good and it pleases you because you want all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So Father, we lift that up to you and pray for those who are in those positions that you would grant them your, your, your mercy, your grace, and draw them to yourself in salvation. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. So I hope you participate in that. I, I think sometimes you know, we, we come to church or I pastor in such a way as to uh, not ensure that we're participating with one another. So lifting, lifting our lives and our days and our needs and our petitions to God as Jesus taught his disciples to do, as we pray for one, ourselves and one another that we would not be overwhelmed by the day, but in fact our hearts would be transformed, our minds would be at peace, resting in you and, our, and our, the way we think and what we think about are being changed from anxious thoughts to things that are beautiful and noble and praiseworthy. And then the, the command for us to pray for everyone, but in particular those who God has established to govern, that we would, we, would, uh, we would join him in that prayer and in that want. So this is what we're doing. We are moving forward in this idea of rejoicing. So if you have the notes, awesome. I hope they're open. Um, you, you know, it's um, <laughs> in the note it says, rejoice, you are participating with Jesus he rejoiced in what was to come, what it was he was accomplishing, and therefore was willing to suffer to bring it about. So we too get to do the same. We get to participate with God. And for what should a Christian suffer? We're going to get to that in a moment. So this is what I want us to do. I want us to go to Matthew, first of all, Matthew 5, uh, verses uh, 1 through 12. And this is what I, one of the things I want us to do. I want to think in this context. We love the Sermon on the Mount. We love the Beatitudes in particular because it, it is an ethic that is so profoundly different than what we see in the world that it, it just stands in stark contrast to everything we are and everything we experience. Um, and, it, and it's good. It's good. We see it and it's just there's something about it in, in, in the lives of, in the minds of, and in the hearts of anyone who reads it, whether they know Jesus or not, they're moved by this passage. They're moved by this teaching. Why? Because again, it stands in just direct contrast in opposition to the ethic of this world. And even, 
even the heart that is stuck in the darkest place recognizes the brokenness around them. They recognize the suffering. They recognize the distance from good and, and what is happening around them. And so when we read this and we see the selflessness with which Jesus speaks and we see, we see the paradox which, with which he's approaching the ethics of this world and calling the ethics of the kingdom forward, we, we, we're just moved by it. So I want to read it, but I, I there, the, you know, there's a there's a moment here that is starkly, um, I don't know, uh, difficult to receive. I suppose as beautiful as this is, and as wonderful the ethic that's that is provided here and the morals that are provided here, the fact is it ends with this call that is really hard to really fathom. So starting at verse three. I lied. Start at verse 1. It says, now when Jesus saw the crowds. Now I love that phrase. This is in Matthew chapter 5. Starting at verse 1. He says, now when Jesus saw the crowds. Please put yourself in the moment. I don't know how far we're going to get into the text today. We'll go as far as we can. But but I, I want us to meet Jesus in this. And I want us to participate with him. And part of participating with Jesus certainly is reading the word and spending time in prayer. But it's also redeeming and engaging the imagination to, to, to put ourselves in the place where we see him and participate. And so this participation has to do with recognizing that Jesus, Jesus came because he loved the world so much. He, he, he came to the earth because God so loved and he walked among us in a way as to reveal the love of the Father, to bring the love of the Son to the, to, to, uh, and the grace and the mercy of the Son, um, the Father through the Son, in the Son, by the Son, uh, that they might find life. And where he came, people were heavy burdened and they were heavy laden and they were broken and they were captive. You know, if we go back to Isaiah and look at uh, the prophecies regarding Jesus, it says that he came to set the captives free, to break the binds of sin, to break the binds of the law, to, to, to free the hearts and the souls of mankind. This is why Jesus came. So we can take all of that understanding of who Jesus was and what he did came to do and to whom he came and the condition they were in when he got here. And when, so when we see this phrase now, when Jesus saw the crowds, we can engage our imagination in this moment and, and wonder, what did Jesus feel? What was happening here? How do we participate with him in this? Now remember this. Those of us who have this relationship with God in Christ are now filled with the Holy Spirit. You know what the Holy Spirit does? The Holy Spirit reveals to us the very heart, the very mind, and the very spirit of God. And so what we can do is engage with the Holy Spirit in such a way as to allow him to raise, raise up in us that which Jesus was dealing with right here in the moment. It says, now when Jesus saw the crowds, ah, I can only imagine this. This is near the beginning of his ministry. He's, he's beginning to gather his disciples around him. There are people beginning to follow. He's, he's gotten some notoriety, and now he's coming into this, this large area, and the crowds begin to gather around him. The crowds begin to come toward him. And he see, when he saw the crowds, when he sees the crowds coming, can you imagine this one who so loved the world, what his heart must have done in the moment? Could you imagine what, what, what was raised up in him to want to speak to this group, to be able to, oh, I love this. So it says, now when Jesus saw the crowds, he said he went up on a mountainside. He, he made his way up. For what purpose? That he might be seen and heard. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. Look at what it says. Now and his disciples came to him. And so as the crowds are coming and he's moving up the mountain, the disciples are moving with him in close proximity. And it says he sits down to teach. He sits down. He sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. And in the hearing of the teaching of the disciples, the crowds heard this new thing, this paradox, this reflection of the kingdom, this reflection of God that maybe they'd never imagined before or they didn't understand before or would stand in contrast to what they knew. And he used the word blessed. He came out and said, blessed are, or happy is the one. Hmm. And as he uses the word happy, as he uses this word that, that speaks of this depth of happiness, of satisfaction, of, of, of purity, he contrasts it with conditions that we would normally not think of being happy. 
And he says, happy is the one who's poor in spirit, who comes before God with such a sense of poverty in regard to righteousness that all they can do is bow before him and recognize they bring nothing to the table that can save them. This is really profound. Remember, who is Matthew? He's a Jew, writing to Jews. And not only was he Jew, he was a tax collector, which meant that it, in, it, although he was Jewish and desired for righteousness as the law declared righteousness, as he watched the Pharisees live, Pharisees live out righteousness, he lived on the margins, he was pushed out, he was hated and despised. And, he, and, and so here was a Jew who when, when, he, when he looked at what it was to be righteous, he had nothing. So look what it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who recognize their, their lack of right. Blessed. So Matthew, writing to Jews, is saying, listen, I am one of you, I was one of you, and although I was Jewish and I knew the law and I desired righteousness, I, I knew, I, when I saw Jesus, I knew I, I, I had nothing to bring, I had nothing to give. And I want you to know that the righteousness by which we thought we would be saved we thought we would gain the kingdom of heaven is not the righteousness that God is looking for. He's looking for a broken and contrite heart. He's looking for a poverty, a humble spirit that is so, so, just so recognizing their need that they just bow before the king realizing they have nothing to bring. And he says happy is that person. Happy is the one who recognizes this desperate poverty. Why? Because when they lift their eyes to see, when God reaches down and grants his favor, when he touches the heart of the one who is utterly emptied of himself, when they look up to see, when God's eyes meet their eyes, when his hand touches their heart, when his spirit touches their spirit, what happens? They are now filled. And what are they filled with? They're filled with the kingdom of heaven. They're filled, filled with the spirit of God. They are, they are rendered mercy as to not have received the judgment that they deserved and grace to receive the life that they never should have gotten. That's what God does. And that's what he did. And that's what he does in us. Blessed is the one who is so empty and so devoid of self that when they come before God, they are an empty vessel ready to be filled. This is the ethic Jesus spoke of. This is the righteousness that he spoke of. And this is when he opened the kingdom of heaven to every Jew who thought you had to look like a Pharisee and you had to be able to recite the law and, and, and God's hand on you was a measure of his favor. And whatever, for whatever reason, if you lacked material, material possessions, if you lacked wealth and riches, if you lacked position and power, if you lacked, then God, apparently the kingdom is not. And Matthew is writing what Jesus said. And he said, no. No, no, no. The kingdom of heaven are for, the, for anyone whose heart is broken and contrite, who recognize their poverty, who comes before God knowing that there's nothing righteous about them and ready to be filled by the, very, by the mercy and grace of God. Theirs is now the kingdom. He was, he was completely flipping upside down the understanding of what the kingdom of heaven was and what it was to know God and to be accepted by God and gain the favor of God and to be filled by God. Happy is that person. Then he goes on and he builds from this, and I'm not gonna dig into any more of these. I, I, I just want us to see something here. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who are meek, who are gentle, who are humble, who are tender, for they will inherit the earth. They are the ones who will gain the blessings of God the favor of God. See, that's completely contrary to the world's ethic. We think it's the conqueror and the mighty warrior. No, he says, blessed are the meek and the humble and the broken and tender. Blessed are the contrite. They will inherit all the blessings of God. They will be the ones who walk in peace. They will be the one who bring the kingdom forward and the kingdom in them will conquer the world. Blessed are those who are meek. Blessed are those who are tender. Blessed are those who are humble. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who deeply desire God's character and for God's character to be seen and for his kingdom to move forward. And righteousness not being doing the right thing the right way. And right, no, righteousness is in rightness and character, rightness with God, rightness from God, rightness through God. Knowing what is right and just and fair and good. Blessed are those who thirst for that, thirst for God's ethic to, to overwhelm this world for his morals to be represented in this world, and for his person to be the one who generates all of it. 
The one who thirsts for these things will be filled. They will find satisfaction as God fills them. Blessed are the merciful. They will be shown mercy. Blessed are the one who sees someone who is wrecked and who is broken and who is in desperate need of being forgiven and they grant it. Blessed are the pure in heart whose heart is fully devoted to God, who continues to push back the affections, of this, the, the affections their hearts have for this world, if, continue to just push those things back and allow God and God's desires to be the object of their affection. When this happens, they will see God. When they remove all the idols, as they perpetually go through the day, go through life, and remove those things that, that for whatever reason, have drawn their attention or their obsession or their possession, and they push it to the side, and they lift their eyes to God. And this is a perpetual movement. And he's saying, blessed are those who are pure in heart. Blessed are those who keep their heart unadulterated. Blessed are those who seek after God, who walk up in an upright way. They will see God. They will experience God. They will know God. And blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who come in and see a broken world and broken relationships and broken people and walk in such a way as to bring God to bear, to bring his truth to bear, to bring the kingdom to bear, and to bring peace between man and God first, man within man, and man and man. They'll be called children of God. Well, why? Because this is God's intent. Therefore, we are doing what God does. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Those, those who come in and they live a life that looks like Jesus. Merciful, faithful, kind, gracious, honest, transparent, real. But real in such a way that is, is an expression of the kingdom. An expression of goodness, an expression of humility. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They have this thing. It is born in them, and it is born out of them. It is the other piece of bread. What does it say at, the, at verse 3? It says, blessed are the poor, they will, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for that righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They will receive it as God fills their poverty-stricken heart, and they bring it forward by living a Christ-like life, even being persecuted because that kingdom is now born in them and is born, being born out of them. This is really, really important. I came here for two reasons. One, we love this passage. We love it. We, we love to read it. We love to dwell on it. We love to hope for it. We love to wish for it. We, we, we love it. But the other side of it is this, is that we, we've sometimes failed to see that in loving the ethic and the morals that are presented and loving the rewards of those who would, who would um, um, be happy to look for these things and would receive them from God because God sees where we want the things that he wants, we forget that it ends in suffering. It ends in persecution. It ends by, because, and it ends in that way because we become a people who don't belong on this earth. We're Aliens and strangers here. Our lives don't match the rest of the world. Our ethic is utterly different. Our morals are, are deeper and richer and, and, and purer. Not, and it's not because of anything we've done. It's because of God in us. It's because of his kingdom being born in us. Our hearts being emptied and we see ourselves as, as just utterly empty. He pours himself into us. And the rest of these things begin to bear itself out. Now, the other reason I wanted to come here is this. We're talking about participating. This is participation. The other thing we don't look at in this text is that when, when we see this, this thing that Jesus is doing, he's saying, when you empty yourself, when you come before God utterly poverty-stricken and poor and empty, and you, you, you allow him, you give him permission to, you give him room to fill, him, fill, to fill you with himself, here's the next thing. You, the, all this rest of the stuff is you participating in the kingdom. You participating in the divine nature. You participating in the life in the manner and the way of Jesus. That's what this is. 
Because none of us can live this out without Christ Jesus in us. And once it's happened, we begin to participate with him in the kingdom. We bring the kingdom forward. And the reason persecution comes is because we are now vessels of Christ who was himself persecuted. And now us having his life in us, having the, bringing the kingdom forward, living out this thing in front of the entire world amongst those in the world, we will receive persecution because he was persecuted. We are now participating in the kingdom. We are bringing it forward. Our lives reflect now this ethic more and more and more. And I want us to see that because we're being asked to participate. We're being asked to participate. We're given the privilege of participation. This is a privilege and an honor. Why do I say that? Look what it goes on to say. Look at verse 10 again. It says, blessed are those, blessed, happy is the one who's persecuted because of this righteousness, because of the kingdom being formed and born in you, because of the nature of Jesus being formed in you in such a way that it begins to, it just, it rises up and it bears fruit in your life. Blessed, happy is the one who is persecuted because of righteousness. That is proof of their being part of the kingdom. Theirs is the kingdom. This is a definitive statement. It is. This is a present, perfect statement. It is. It is formed in you. One of the assurances we have that we are in Christ is that we suffer. Sometimes to the point of persecution. Look what it goes on to say. Happy is the one who is persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poverty-stricken one receives it. That ethic is built in them as they now they mourn over sin, they desire and they thirst for righteousness, they bring peace to the world because they have, been, they have experienced peace. Their heart more and more now seeks after God in an upright fashion because it has, it has experienced this filling. Go on to verse 11. So he go, and he repeats it. Each one of these things, he says, now he repeats having the kingdom of heaven at the beginning. Those who are poverty stricken are now filled. Once you're filled, these things will become the desires of your life. These paradoxes will become the things that you desire most. They'll be the things that are formed in you and you'll want, you'll want to display. And you'll be happy when you do. As God works this, just he need, this is like the, kingdom, the yeast of the kingdom being kneaded into the dough is the beatitudes being kneaded into the life of the Christ follower. That's what this is. And Jesus is saying, here it is. Here's the yeast of the kingdom. When you are so poor and empty that, that, that the yeast will actually now permeate who you are, as I need my life in you, this is what happens. He says, as I need you like a loaf of bread, as that yeast goes through you, as the kingdom of heaven is born in you and begins to bear fruit, you will mourn sin, your own and the sin of others. You will, you will grow in character to look just like Jesus, who was meek and humble in heart. You, you will thirst and hunger for righteousness because you've experienced it. You want it and you want it for others. And you want Jesus, you want, we, we just pray. We want God's kingdom to come, right? We want it to come. Well, listen, if y'all want it to come and it's in you, guess, who's it's got, guess who it's gonna come through? It's going to come through you. And so we hunger and thirst for righteousness, and, and he fills us with that. Our heart now reflects his heart in regard to how we see others. We are merciful. We've received mercy. We give mercy, and we get back mercy. And our heart more and more is purified because we no longer are attracted to this world. We no, longer, we no longer crave this world to the degree we did before. As God begins to work this world out of us and needs the, kingdom, the yeast of the kingdom in us, guess what? We don't want that stuff anymore. Our heart becomes more and more pure and we see God more and more. Not only do we see him in, in how he reveals himself in the word, by his spirit, in creation, in the lives of others, but we also see him born in us as we look in the mirror. As he proves himself genuine, he proves the faith in us as being genuine. And we see God. We see him. Our eyes are open to see him in all that he's made and all that he does. And when we see God, we have peace in our heart. We go, oh. So why did I lead us in a prayer in Philippians chapter four? And it says, now think of these things, things that are praiseworthy, things that are good and admirable. Why? Things that are excellent. Because when we put our mind there, when we allow God to remove the anxieties and we take our eyes from that which obsessed us, which is what anxiety does, and to place them on God that our affections would be there, that's the exercising of the purity of heart. That is not a lot, that's making sure that we're not allowing our heart to be infiltrated and adulterated by the things of this world. And we begin to look up and we look for him and we see in him what's excellent. I, you know, I practice this on my way here. I'm riding my scooter on the way in and, and I'm reciting Philippians 4. 
And as I'm reciting Philippians 4, I get down to this verse of now think of these things. And I began to, I just began to think about things that I thought were praiseworthy and noble and excellent and admirable. And uh, you know what happened? I'm riding along and people would have thought I was crazy. I'm zipping along like this and all of a sudden this giant smile just it, it, it just covered my face. And it wasn't like I made myself smile. I couldn't have made myself smile. It, it rose out of my heart. It went into, it filled my mind. I'm like, oh my goodness. And my face just creased with a, just, just a smile. And I thought to myself, if anybody's watching me ride my scooter right now, they're going to think I'm crazy. They're going to look at my face and they go, dude, what is up with that guy? Why? I had this smile. It just, my, it, but here's the thing. What was the smile born out of? It was first and foremost born out of the fact that I had taken my eyes off of what was obsessing me and causing me anxiety. I lifted that up and God to gave it, give it to him. His peace began to descend on me and I began to recite those, thing, those scriptures as he leads me and the things that I began to think about out of the peace rose into my face and I just went, my whole body smiled and I couldn't even make myself not smile. I rejoiced. And some of it was just imagining God, and other of it are gifts that I have that he's given me, blessings. His presence, his proving himself to me by the things that he's made, showing me his life in the life of others. I thought about my grandchildren, each and every one of them. And I thought about how precious each one of their lives is. And I thought about what a gift they are from the Father. And I just smiled. I thought about spending time yesterday riding. My wife and I drove to New York yesterday. And on the drive, I was going through the scriptures. And I'm meditating. And I'm typing. And she's driving along. And I look up. And the, the trees are turning. And it's like God takes his paintbrush. And he dips it in watercolors. And he just dabs it all over the horizon. All kinds of colors. And I looked at it. And I was just overwhelmed by it. And I began to, to actually meditate on how good he was and how creative he was and how ridiculous it is that he uses these colors at such an odd time of the year that things are actually beginning to ebb and life is beginning to come out of the life of the leaves and that's when he chooses to declare his glory and its most profound grandeur as things are dying. And I marveled at that for a moment. And then I thought to myself, boy, is sin, does sin suck? I thought that. Then my meditating on God, I thought, man, sin is awful. I hate it. I hate sin. And then I let myself dwell on what does sin do? And I saw it breaking creation. I saw it harming people. I saw it grieving God and offending him. And all of that caused my heart to rise up to him. And I couldn't help it. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's trying to take our eyes off the, what is temporal and the eyes off of what we know, and the eyes off, off, our eyes off of what we think should make us happy. And he's saying, no, this is what will make you happy. This is what will give your heart satisfaction. This is what will fill you. And the end result isn't what we imagine it being. Look what it says. He says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of this righteousness, who have met God and been filled with him, who, whose spirit is now in him and whose life now reflects the very goodness of Jesus that so we celebrate all the time. But for whatever reason, when we become it and people see it in us and they begin to experience it, those the, who, who aren't attracted to it, those who are, don't appreciate it, will actually hate it. Look what he says. He says, blessed are those, blessed, happy is the one who's persecuted because of the kingdom of heaven born in them and the person of Jesus reflected by them. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is proof of your being part of the kingdom. Verse 11, he, he, he emphasizes it. He says, blessed are you when people insult you, when they think you're ridiculous, when they consider your godly wisdom foolishness. And the decisions you make according to the scriptures and according to the truth is ridiculous or unnecessary or inconvenient or uncomfortable. Ah, oh, golly. Look what it says. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you falsely and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, because of your devotion to me, because of my reflection in you, because of the kingdom of heaven coming through you. 
Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Rejoice and be glad. He's repeating it. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. As you stand firm in the kingdom and you allow God to fill you and you just humbly bring forward Jesus' goodness into the lives of others. As you, ref- if you give them mercy and treat them mercifully and they respond by insulting you or they respond by speaking ill of you or they respond by opposing you or they respond by hating you. He says, wow, <laughs> rejoice and be glad. Well, why? Because great is your reward in heaven. You will receive everything that God, that my Father has for you because you have stood firm, firm. You have reflected him in all ways. You have brought him forward with mercy and grace. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets that were before you. And he goes on in John chapter six to say, and as they've treated me this way, they will treat you this way. As they have hated me, they will hate you. As they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. Why? Because we are participants. The Beatitudes, this little, and I didn't expect to spend this much time here, but I think it's utterly pertinent to where we are today in our lives, in our culture, in our communities, and in our churches. I look at this, and I, th- you know, and so many people think of this as some sort of ethereal thing that God, Jesus, was doing in terms of talking about what the kingdom would be like when it comes, when heaven actually arrives, as we understand heaven. That this would be the ethic of the kingdom on the new earth with the new Jerusalem and our new bodies. Or that this is some sort of philosophical thing that you know at least is some glimmering hope, uh, though unreachable. I don't think it's any of that. I think this is the manifestation of Jesus in us. I think when he starts out with, blessed are those who are utterly poverty stricken, who's so, so empty of self that now they can be filled with God and his righteousness in the kingdom, everything else is what, what births in us as the kingdom of heaven gets, like yeast and bread, gets kneaded through us. And as that happens more and more, and as our reflect, life reflects it more and more, and as mercy begins, begins to be literally the manner in which we see all mankind, be in view of God's mercy, therefore, what's gonna come with that is people who don't understand us or stand opposed to us or think we're ridiculous or foolish. And Jesus knew that. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. And if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. You're not going to be any different than the one who's taught you, the one who's in you. This is not just what will be. This is what is being born in the life of every believer. And this is, this is the litmus. And the proof of our being filled with the kingdom of heaven is the fact that our lives are an utter, con- an utter contrast with this world. Our lives are perpetually more and more different than that of the world. Our perspective is different than that of the world. Our attitude is different than that of the world. And our approach to this life is different than the rest of the world. It's just different. And so if you turn to First Peter 4 with me, I'm just going to read this text Um, And we'll maybe dig further into it later. Not today, at another time. Because Peter, I think, reflecting on this moment, remember Peter was present there with Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. It says his disciples came to him. Band, go ahead and get in place if you would so I don't run over. Peter would have been present. It says his disciples sat around him. He said he saw the crowds. He went up on a mountainside and his disciples came with him and he began to teach them. So Peter's right there in the middle. And I can't imagine if Peter's, while Peter is writing to all these beleaguered, scattered, um, anxiety-ridden believers that he's reflecting on everything that Jesus taught about the kingdom and that which he, he had no idea what Jesus was talking about at the time but as, but as Peter, Peter's faith was now put in the hands of God and he was filled especially by the spirit on the day of Pentecost and his life would, uh, was utterly transformed and the kingdom of heaven was now born in him he's beginning to see the reality of the Beatitudes not as some ethereal plane that maybe we, we hope to see or maybe some ethic and we put it on a no he saw this 
is the reality of the kingdom being born. And he remembered that. He, listen, he, he's thinking to himself, he heard the parable. Jesus was teaching the disciples when he said, the kingdom of heaven will be like a woman needing bread. And when she puts the yeast in and needs it, that, the, that little bit of yeast will work through the whole bit of dough. That's the Beatitudes. That's the kingdom of heaven. That is in the heart of, and soul of every believer as the spirit of God moves in them. And so Peter, in reflecting on all this, he says, dear friends, don't be surprised at your fiery ordeal. He was standing there when Jesus turned to his disciples and said, listen, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. And if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. In fact, he warned Peter in, the, in, in, in John 21, after we, we talk about Peter being restored to Jesus, which must have been a great joy and relief for Peter. But what we don't realize is after his being restored, Jesus then tells him how he's going to die. Tells him right then and there, you're, listen, you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you, wherever you went wherever you want, but you know what? When you get older, they're, they're going to dress you and they're going to take you a place you don't want to go. And John puts in a little parenthetical statement. He goes, in, in doing so, Jesus was telling Peter how he would die. And Peter, being stunned by that, turned around and saw John following and said, well, what about him? And Jesus said, that's none of your business. What if I want him to live till I come back? You, you follow me. What I have for you, that's for you. What I have for him, that's for him. You come with me. Peter has all of this in his heart, all of this in his mind, and it's raising up in him. And so he says, he's calling out to his brothers and sisters. In fact, the next chapter we get into in 1 Peter 5 5, is Peter talking as a shepherd, looking at his beloved sheep, those which Jesus said, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. And Peter, now the shepherd, is thinking about all the the, the flock that he's been given to, to, to oversee gently, gracious, humbly, lovingly. This letter is written to this group, and he says, dear friends, I love that, dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you, and that to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. Jesus warned us that this would be so. He said this is the way it would be. As the kingdom of heaven is formed in you, you are more and more contrary to this world. You're more, you don't, you live in contrast to it. It won't understand you. It won't get it. Look what he says next. Verse 13. But rejoice. So let me read that again. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fire ordeal that has come upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice. Be happy. As you, in as much as you listen, participate in the sufferings of Christ. You participate. You are a part of so that you may be, listen, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Overjoyed when he, when he is born and birthed in you. Overjoyed when his righteousness seeps from you. Overjoyed when he comes and he says, well done, good and faithful, spirit, faithful servant. When his glory is revealed. Corinthians says we are growing from glory to glory and reflecting Jesus. Jesus said, John said about Jesus, he said, we, we have received a glory. There's a glory that in having been made by God, it is replaced by a glory that is now created in Christ Jesus. We are moving in glory. So rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed. What are the sufferings of Christ? Read the Beatitudes. Go back. What are they? We are broken over this broken world. We are grieving and mourning what we see. We desperately want to bring the kingdom forward and we want our lives to reflect it so that his joy would be born in us. Happy is the one. He goes on to say in verse 14, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. He's remembering what Jesus taught him that first time on the side of the mountain. If you are insulted because of my name, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. You are radiant, resplendent. You are reflecting the very nature of God in you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler, somebody who gets themselves into other people's business or is about the world's business instead of the kingdom business. No. However, if you suffer for being a Christian... 
for carrying the name of Jesus, for having his character and his nature, do not be ashamed. Do not shrink back. But praise God that you bear his name. Praise God that his seal is on you. Praise God that he is being seen in you. Praise God that those very beatitudes, which was the yeast of the kingdom being kneaded through the dough of each heart and soul of every person who comes to Christ and the very church itself is now being manifest. You're beginning to be inflated. You are beginning to rise. Isn't that fantastic? We'll get into this more later. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for how ridiculous your teaching is, your wisdom, your mercy, your grace, and even your salvation. Father, we pray that we would we would bear your seal in such a way as to not shrink back, but in fact be moved by the fact that we are children of God. We are co-heirs with the Son, filled with your Spirit, given the privilege of of bringing the kingdom of heaven forward. May you be seen in us more and more. May your glory rest on us, not because of anything we are, but because of who you are in us and who we are to you. And may we not in any way, in any way, inhibit that glory by being seen, by acting in a way, being persecuted for things that are not for righteousness, not the kingdom, not Jesus, but just by our sinful selves. Just thank you and we praise you and we, what a, we, we get to participate with you. Mm. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
joining us today for our online service. And um, a couple quick reminders as you take off today. Remember there are uh, groups for both men and women to check out on the website and uh, register for. You want to do that ASAP if you want to get in on the first one this week. So do that. And the drive through adventure on the 24th, you can go ahead and sign up for that anytime as well. That's going to be a blast to, to uh, do the big scavenger hunt together. Remember, you can win really cool prizes on that one. And, um, and then as soon as we're back in yellow or orange, we'll be back together in the services at 9 and 1050, hopefully next week. We'll pray that way. Hope you have an awesome day and an awesome week. Grace and peace, my friends.